Good afternoon, everyone. It's been quite a whirlwind 24 hours, let me tell you, but it's really great to be settling in. My name is Lana Payne, and I'm the newly elected national president of Unifor. Let me start by saying what an absolute pleasure it is to be here today with our Unifor Auto Leadership Team, and what an honor it is to present you our new program to build Canada's auto sector called Navigating the Road Ahead. I want to thank you all for joining us online, and I want to thank you for your ongoing work covering our union and covering this critical sector. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, Indigenous territory and territories on which we are meeting today. Even if we are in different physical locations, we still, still recognize the land we are on. Joining me today is Auto Sector Director Dino Kyoto, John Dagnolo, President of Unifor Local 200 and Chair of Unifor Auto Council, representing members across Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis, and Emil Nabut, President of Unifor Local 195, and also, pre he wears many hats, and also President of Unifor's Independent Parts Supplier Council, representing thousands of members working in various Tier 1 and Tier 2 suppliers. It should come as no surprise that our union is putting this document front and center today as one of our first orders of business. Unifor is Canada's auto workers union. We represent more than 40,000 members working in assembly plants, parts factories, and dealerships from coast to coast. In 2020, bargaining with the Detroit three automakers, our union made a pivotal role in securing new product mandates at various assembly plants. That including achieving the unthinkable by negotiating a restart to truck assembly in Oshawa when no one ever thought it was possible. That round of bargaining served as a catalyst for other new investments in domestic violence, in, in domestic vehicle assembly, batteries and component parts over the past two years. It even included a long awaited public commitment put to put new product into Brampton assembly along with a brand new battery cell gigafactory in Windsor. Looking at all of the promised investments, I think it's safe to say that for the first time in a very long time, the future looks bright for Canada's auto sector. But I wanna be perfectly clear, none of this is a foregone conclusion. A lot of work still needs doing for Canada to maximize the benefits of this shift. I'll also say that success looks a lot different to auto workers than it does to corporate investors. Despite all the positive news, Canada is at an important inflection point. This story is still being written. There's never been a more important time for governments to solidify an ambitious and comprehensive industrial strategy for this sector, a policy that ensures our investment strategy, along with our trade rules, our infrastructure, our climate policies, and of course, labor market programs, are all working in tandem to maximize the benefits for Canada and especially for Canadian workers. What we are presenting today is perhaps our union's most ambitious effort to map out such an approach. You will see this reflected in the policy's 29 recommendations grouped under five core pillars, which include growing the domestic industry, managing the net zero transition, enhancing skills, creating high quality union jobs, and advancing equity and inclusion. All critical components required in any well-rounded industrial strategy. Now I'd like to invite Auto Director Dino Kyoto to provide a bit more detail on the policy development itself, as well as some of the specific recommendations. Dino, over to you. Thanks, Lana. And again, thank you for joining us today. I especially want to thank the local union leadership of our union, our Unifor Auto and IPS councils and staff for their tremendous work. Navigating the Road Ahead is a program for auto workers by auto workers. It's the product of a year long process undertaken by Unifor's Auto Policy Working Group, led by myself, Director of Auto, and Louis Dominguez, the former Director of IPS, who is now Unifor's London Area Director, and Louis' successor, Paul Shields, is with us today. Folks may not realize, but this is the fourth official auto policy crafted by the union since 2001. Each policy took a concise look at the sector and presented recommendations to promote its growth from the perspective of workers. 
That includes those in production and the skilled trades, as well as office and clerical jobs, parts distributions, and others. The previous three policies responded directly to threats facing the industry at that time. Threats to jobs, threats to disinvestment. Auto workers have grown accustomed to the insecurity of the sector in past decades, worsened by production speed up, just in time supply chains, unfair trade, and other global economic headwinds. Our 2002 policy responded to the dismantling of the Canada US Auto Pact. Our 2012 policy responded to the devastating aftershocks of the global financial crisis. Our 2015 policy responded to the steady decline in production volumes, job losses, and lack of vision for a clean vehicle future. But today is a different story. Today we present the policy roadmap at a time of growth, renewal and hope, a time when the federal and provincial governments appear to have shared objectives, a time when Canada wields significant advantage in a booming supply chain and can flex some of its economic muscle. The question for us is how does Canada take further advantages of this moment? How do we build an auto sector that maximizes the benefit to work and all stakeholders. Well, I now want to invite John and Emil, our frontline local union leadership, to share some of our proposals with you. John. Thanks, Dino. On behalf of Unifor's Auto Council and, uh, and the Auto Policy Working Group, I want to thank you personally for your leadership and tire tireless work on this file. Having served as a chair of the 2020 Ford Master Bargaining Committee, I've seen a landscape shift for the Canadian auto sector almost in real time. As Lana said, our 2020 bargaining with the Detroit Three was a watershed moment for this country. Billions of dollars in new investment in product programs, including in electric vehicles, is something our members haven't seen on this scale in a long, long time. But building on this momentum and growing the industry requires a consistent effort from our government and automakers. In our policy document, you'll see recommendations for the federal government to establish a comprehensive industrial strategy for the auto sector, a strategy that is not national in scope, a plan that we think is best managed by a dedicated federal oversight body. We also recommend that this strategy adopt a whole of supply chain approach. Investment attraction in the EV supply chain. We can't limit our ambition to critical minerals or assembly programs. Canada must commit itself to build out a full Canadian made supply chain. That means investments in critical component parts. Among major automakers, there's currently no production scheduled for e powertrain components like e motors and axles in Canada. Zero. Canada also lacks any major capacity in semiconductors. This just simply isn't good enough. We have to grow these and other subsectors to foster stronger domestic automotive ecosystems. Building up our domestic production capacity can help limit the risk of supply chain shocks like those have devastated auto workers across the country these past years. In our roadmap, we urge governments to purchase fleet vehicles that support significant Canadian content. We also call on governments to raise their level of ambition on new charging stations and help make emissions-free vehicles for affordable wherever possible, linking infrastructure, procurement, and consumer incentives with industrial development objectives make for good, coherent policies. These are just some of the recommendations presented in our policy roadmap. I'll now pass the floor to the IPS Council President, Emil Naboot, to walk you through some additional proposals. Thank you. Thank you, John. I would like to emphasize what was said, that worker in both the assembly and part sector, we believe this is a very exciting and hopeful moment. It is an opportunity to drive economic growth zero emission innovation and sustain hundreds of thousands of good jobs. Workers understand the opportunity, but we also understand the challenges that come with the electric shift that we are seeing these challenges all throughout the supply chain. We know that EVs have far for, fewer moving parts than gas power car, car that government all over the world are starting to phase out. 
We know that worker in a supplier firm that build a part for engine, transmission, fuel system, and exhaust system will face pressure as this transition begins. We are already seeing this in places like Ingersoll, where uniform members are starting to assembly electric van, resulting in closed vac factory and layoff. Our policy call attention to this challenge. And in response, we call on government to undertake a targeted and a proactive transition support program for a risk Canadian firm. We think government can help existing supplier identify a new product, market, restrain their worker, retrain their worker, and sustain good job. Where job cannot be sustained, we also urge government to establish a special labor market adjustment program tailored to the auto sector. This would include enhanced transition support, as well as access to the new skill training and job relocation. We also recommend that government develop a national auto sector skill inventory to help identify gap and focus training support for worker moving forward. In this policy, we celebrate the successes we have seen so far and the opportunity ahead, but we do not look, we do not look away from the real concern that auto workers face. I will now pass it over to the president, Lana Payne, to wrap things up. Lana. Thank you, Emil. And once again, thank you to all of the members of the working group for putting this document together. Both John and Emil have spoken to some of the bigger industry building and tra tra transitional concerns of the industry. Um, among the core pillars of our roadmap is our call for good union jobs. There is also a call for greater workplace diversity and inclusion efforts. It is one thing to build an industry, but it's another thing to build an industry that fosters high quality employment, community development, dignity, and respect. Uh, Canada's auto sector is known as a bastion of good jobs. Lots of because they're unionized jobs. And frankly, that's mostly because of unions like ours who have bargained and fought for them over the generations. Our, net, our new policy makes a series of recommendations on government for bold labor reforms that support collective bargaining and unionization. Further, our policy recognizes that Canada's auto sector must do a lot better supporting diversity and inclusion. It's a sector that for the most part underrepresents women and workers of color and must up its game. Our program calls for wider application of employment equity laws and greater incentives to pursue inclusive hiring strategies. And perhaps most importantly, we recognize how the shift to EVs and the need for critical minerals intersects with Canada's path towards reconciliation. Fair, responsible and consent driven approaches to mining development is essential. Working collaboratively with indigenous communities and maximizing local economic development for First Nations is a must. We present these and other recommendations to paint a full picture of this industrial transformation and how we navigate the road ahead. As I'm sure those watching will note, this policy covers a lot of ground and our presentations today really only scratch the surface. Our union is eager to get this into the hands of government and open a dialogue on these issues moving forward. Well, actually, if they needed a policy, they could just adopt ours. I do want to note that earlier today, Unifor delegates also unanimously endorsed a resolution that commits the necessary resources to this work. Delegates committed our union to campaign on these policy recommendations over the coming year as we ready ourselves for the next round of collective bargaining with the Detroit Three. I will say that I'm very excited about this work. I'm excited about the potential we have and I'm eager to work on behalf of our members. With that, we're happy to take any questions. Uh, the Unif Unifor is giving media unrestricted access to our videos and images on the Auto Hub website. That's uniforautohub.ca. Hi folks, I am Shelly Amiot. I'm with the Unifor Communications Department. I do have a running list of reporters who'd like to ask questions. I will ask you to unmute yourself following your name and you can ask Lana Payne a question, any member of the team that you've heard. Um, and we will uh, proceed first with David Kennedy from Auto News. One moment, David, we'll ask you to unmute. Hi everyone, thanks for taking questions. 
Uh, I just have uh, one and probably a follow-up. I'm just wondering uh, what uh, prep is underway for the 2023 uh, Auto Talks uh, with uh, the automakers you represent or you represent, and uh, how will this new policy inform the approach? Well, first of all, obviously, we're not going to let all this good work go to waste. Uh, it's going to be very useful uh, as we go towards the bargaining table. This is uh, not just about um, building a, a proper industrial strategy for Canada, but will inform uh, some of the conversations that will take place at bargaining. And, uh, and secondly, uh, to your first question, uh, work has started. We're a year ahead, and uh, we know uh, we're excited actually to get into bargaining in a year from now. But yeah, we've uh, we've started our internal discussions for sure, and uh, we'll be working really hard uh, over the coming year uh, to do that work and have our committees ready. Do you know? I don't know if you want to add to that. No, very very well said. Thank you. Great, and I just have one follow-up then. Uh, obviously, uh, there'll be a bit of a change next year with the talks uh, coinciding with uh, UAW talks in the US. Uh, do you anticipate uh, you know, any major changes uh, as a result of that? We've been uh, having uh, you know, discussions with the UAW. We have good relationships with them. Actually, we just had a delegation that went to their convention. Uh, both John and Dino were there. And uh, we uh, will continue to have critical uh, discussions with them as we head into bargaining. I think it's really important that we're both going in the same, uh, in the same year and uh, gives us uh, more power at the bargaining table doing so. John, did you want to add to that? I know you were in Detroit. No, you're right, Lana. The, the important thing is to be, communication is key. And uh, both the UAW side and our side came together to just to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. So it was very important. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, we are going to try uh, Jacob Barker at the CBC again. One moment, we're going, we'll ask you to unmute so you can ask your question. We're not hearing anything, Shelley. Hello. Oh, there we go. Can you Hi, hear me? Jacob. Yes, Jacob, go proceed. Okay, sorry, I'm running between two computers here. Um, I uh, So I wanted to ask about the, um, the uh, diversity in the workplace section of the presentation. Um, and I also heard you talking about uh, inclusive hiring strategies. I just wonder what specific things are being done in automotive workplaces uh, to encourage um, inclusivity and uh, um, yeah, just promoting uh, this to, to people that maybe aren't uh, as represented in uh, the uh, on the floors of the of the factories and things like that. Well, we've made some progress uh, here already. You probably are aware that with respect to the new hires at the Oshawa assembly plant, 50% of them were women. And uh, I've actually had a, a couple of discussions already uh, with one of the automakers around uh, their policies going forward around being more inclusive and diverse in terms of their hiring practices. This obviously will be an issue that we'll uh, discuss at the bargaining table as well. But I think it's, it's critical um, you know that our that our workplaces shape and form uh, uh, form our communities, and uh, that's that's the kind of conversation we'll be having uh, going forward. And I think uh, Dino and John will probably want to add to that as well. Uh, some other work, obviously, that we've done uh, historically at the last round of bargaining was our racial justice work, but there's many many other things, obviously. So Dino, John. Uh, th thanks, Lana. So um, what I can suggest or just add on to what Lana said, uh, because uh, it's, it's very important, is uh, we have taken some of the model that General Motors has uh, applied with regards to their hiring practices and 50% uh, of their workforce, like Lana said, is, is, is women, which is amazing. Uh, but also by extension of that, we've talked to the other employers suggesting that there is a path forward and they're doing very well at Oshawa and everything is, is excellent. Uh, so, so we know it works. We know it's, it's the right thing to do. And we know uh, that this is a positive aspect uh, for all people in Canada to, uh, to uh, rely upon to move forward with. And uh, we're going to continue to do just that. John, did you want to add in there? Um, I can tell you um, we have had many discussions with the company on this, and they recognize it. Um, 
there's no when we when I talk to Ford Motor Company, they are making sure that that we have um, everybody inclusive when it comes to looking at our hiring practices now, and it's very important. And um, Ford Motor Company was actually uh, led bargaining at the last set of negotiations, and like Lana said, how important. We, uh, we had that racial justice advocate come into our lives. It uh, is a very important step for us, for our workers, and also for the company. So we'll continue to drive that. And uh, I think we're gonna be very successful in attaining that. Thing. And I, I, I would add one last thing to that. It's also making sure, because we have a meal here, but making sure that the entire supply chain in the, in the auto sector is reflective of you know, equity and inclusion and uh, from our assembly plants all the way to the parts sector. Okay, next um, we, oh, pardon, go ahead. Oh, sorry, do, is there a follow-up or? No. You, absolutely, you may proceed. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I just further down uh, in that section, you talk about um, uh, minerals uh, and and moving to EV and uh, the types of agreements that have to be reached uh, with indigenous groups um, here in Canada um, uh, to provide the parts uh, for these vehicles. Um, you know, how does the union uh, sort of fit into those conversations? And I mean, we're talking about inclusivity as well. Um, so, I mean, just in terms of, uh, yeah, making sure those um, contracts are made in, in ways that uh, everybody can sort of get on the same page with. Yeah, well, I actually see the union as playing a critical role here. Uh, we do a, a lot of work on reconciliation in our union, and I think it's really important that we understand that we cannot be going forward with future mining developments if we are not having the consent of Indigenous communities in order for that to happen. And, uh, and I think our union is, in a, is, is positioned in a very good place to be able to to be part of those conversations. We have and ourselves done a lot of reconciliation work. So we know that this is, uh, this is critical to how we build uh, going forward into the future. And um, it, you know, the, the reality is we live in a time where we have to be recognizing that indigenous people need to have a say over all of this. And, uh, and, they're, and we would want to, to be helping uh, make sure that that occurs. Okay, now Thank we're you. going to take a question from Kaylee Hall with Detroit News. Kaylee, I will ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Did that work? Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for taking questions. I appreciate it. I wanted to find out um, what you're doing now to unionize, uh, you know, supplier supplier facilities that may not be yet unionized or even established yet. Uh, for example, Solanus is planning a, a battery plant with LG. Um, are you talking to the automaker about that? Is that going to be one of the things going into negotiations that you're you're looking at? I'm sure it is, but just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it, it's critical that these new facilities are part of our union. We are the Canadian Auto Workers Union. Our job uh, will be to organize these facilities, uh, but also to have conversations with the companies around how we can get recognition in, the, in these uh, cases. And of course, it's not just uh, the, the uh, example that you referenced, but uh, the, the new facility that GM is planning uh, in Quebec as well. Uh, and just one follow up, as far as like what happens now with this plan that you guys are presenting, do you take it to uh, government officials and present it or what's the next steps? Yes, they'll be so tired of hearing from us on this, it won't even be fun. <laughs> <laughs> a full steam ahead. Uh, we'll, we're, uh, we'll be obviously talking with the federal government, provincial governments, municipal governments too, because they have a role to play here and, uh, and Indigenous communities as well. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Kaylee. And next we have Ian Bickus from the Canadian Press. Ian, I will ask you to unmute yourself once given the prompt and you can ask your questions. Thanks for, for taking me in. You can uh, hear me all right? Yes. Great. There's a, there's a widespread blackout in downtown Toronto, so I'm on Wi-Fi here. But um, just to, on the 
government programs, it seems like the government has been doing quite a bit already. Uh, I just want to know kind of where you see them falling short at this point, because on the one of the recommendations, they are kind of already moving on, uh, it seems. So I guess, where do you see that the, the government yeah, most failing at this point? Or Well, I think one of the uh, one of the points we've been making, they have done a lot. We recognize that. But I think it's really important that the, the next step is actually adopting this industrial comprehensive policy. It's not enough to, to, to do as we've been going. We need something more fulsome, uh, which is why we're putting forward this document. And, and as we've mentioned earlier, our teams have been working on this for a whole year. We've been consulting with our members. We know what's needed to, to build the industry. We know what's needed in, this, in the supply chain part of this. I think it's also critical, and this is something that... Uh, that John mentioned earlier, and that's you know having a kind of standalone government department to coordinate this work. Uh, it's not enough right now that we have five, six, 20 uh, different departments who, uh, who have different uh, responsibilities uh, around this file. Uh, we really need to have a coordinated approach uh, so that we're making sure that we're taking advantage of every single opportunity uh, that we can have. And we're building as many good jobs in Canada as possible. Uh, from assembly all through the uh, through the supply chain. And then just in terms of dialogue so far, obviously the, the policy just came out today, but have you had any kind of assurances on, on some of these policies so far? Or uh, what kind of have you heard? Uh, what has the union heard in terms of having a ministry dedicated to, to the auto sector? It's quite a novel suggestion. So yeah, just kind of what have you heard from government so far? Um, well, we haven't had a discussion with them yet. Uh, we'll be sending them the, the policy. Uh, it's brand new. You're all getting it first. <laughs> we wanted you to have it. <laughs> but lots of work ahead with that. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any more reporter questions. So Lana, you can wrap things up. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our members and our local leaders in the auto sector who joined us today. And uh, thanks for covering uh, this sector. We really, really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you real soon. Oh, yeah. oh.